Good morning everyone and a happy Sabbath to you. I wish I could be with you in person, um, but I'm grateful that technology allows me to still be able to worship with you today and to be able to share this message. The message today that I want to share with you is called Jesus in ISO. Jesus in solitary places, in isolation. And it seems like a fitting topic for us here in Melbourne, don't you think? The message that I want to share with you begins and ends in a solitary place, a lonely place, a deserted place. And it, it's something that I think we all can relate to at this time. We often think that Jesus can't relate to what's happening to us today, that his story, which happened more than 2000 years ago, is something that is so far beyond comprehension or beyond our today experience that it's somehow irrelevant. But I have found that the more time I spend in scripture, the more I discover that actually scripture has a lot to say about our very current experience. What I want to do today is I want to read through Mark chapter 1 verses 35 to 45 and I want to dig a little deeper into this passage because I believe that as we read through this passage we're going to find three types of isolation. We're going to find a chosen isolation, a self, let's call it self isolation. We're going to find a quarantine isolation where someone has been quarantined and put in isolation. And we're going to discover forced isolation, which is somehow just a little bit more different. And then I hope that as we finish this reading through this passage, we will be able to extract a practical application for today. What are we doing? What have we been doing while we have been in isolation? So let's begin. I might just start with a short prayer and then we'll begin our reading in Mark chapter 1 verse 35. Let's, let's have a short prayer. Loving Father, we thank you for the opportunity to spend some time in your word this morning. We thank you that we are able to worship together, even through technology. And Lord, as we open your word now, we ask that your Holy Spirit will teach us, guide us, convict us. Prepare our hearts, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So let's begin our reading in Mark chapter 1 and verse 35. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. Now Jesus had been pretty busy the day and the night before. The day had started in the synagogue, and then after that he went to Peter's place where he healed Peter's mother-in-law, and then when the Sabbath had ended, some people well, actually, the whole town, it seems, came out um, to see Jesus and to be healed by Jesus. So there were many, many people. And to be honest, I don't know how long it takes to heal a whole town, but I imagine it was a late night for Jesus. And so early in the morning, while it was still dark, this verse tells us Jesus did not sleep in. Jesus was not um, in bed because he was tired from all these healings. Jesus had left the house while it was still dark to find a deserted place. And I want you to notice the intentionality. It's still dark. The sun has not risen. And so I, I don't know how hard that is for you, but it's hard for me to get up early. But Jesus left the house and he went to find a place to be alone. Now, this is an active movement, an int intentional movement. Now, currently, we've been in lockdown in Melbourne for a really long time, a really long time. And so my intentionality has been to get up in the morning and get on the stationary bike, the exercise bike. And some days, I have to tell you, getting out of bed is really hard when you know you can't actually go anywhere. But I, I have made a promise to myself that I need to. I need to get up. And, and I use that time in many ways devotionally. I read my devotional. I, I read scripture. Sometimes I listen to a sermon while I'm on the bike. And so I use that time to, to connect. But it requires intentionality. I have to keep telling myself, tomorrow morning you're getting up and you're going on that bike. Now, G Jesus chose to come away to self-isolate to a lonely, deserted place where nothing could separate him from God. This is the chosen isolation. 
Jesus is constantly being interrupted by crowds. And so he knows the need to find a solitary place. And we read in all the Gospels how Jesus is often escaping crowds. If we were to turn to Matthew in chapter 14, we read, Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from all the towns. In Luke 4, 42, we read, At daybreak he departed and went into a deserted place, and the crowds were looking for him. When they reached him, they wanted to prevent him from leaving them. In John 11, 54, Jesus therefore no longer walked openly among the Jews and went from there to a town called Ephraim in the region near the wilderness, and he remained there with his disciples. In Mark chapter 6, we read, um, Jesus said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while for many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. So why does Jesus want to self-isolate? Why has he chosen to come away to a deserted place and to be alone? Well, in Luke chapter 5, verse 15 and 16, we read, but now more than ever, the word about Jesus spread abroad Many crowds would gather to hear him and to be cured of their diseases, but he would withdraw to deserted places. Jesus would often choose this time to be alone to pray. This was a time for prayer for him. <clears throat> he sought out deserted places. He chose this time of isolation to talk with the Father. I want you to picture Jesus in this solitary place. What does it look like? It's a place with no people, no interruptions, a place to talk with the Father, a place to sit and listen, to be strengthened and ready for whatever is next. Do you think this place of isolation for Jesus is easy to find? Well, let's keep reading in our passage. Verse 36, Mark chapter 1, verse 36, And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. Actually, let me just say that when Simon and his companions went hunting for Jesus, this only hints at the desperation. The verb suggests that they've actually engaged in an urgent manhunt for Jesus. They have been searching high and low. And now that they've found him, they interrupt his moment of private meditation to inform him that everyone is looking for him. It's such a funny statement. Jesus, what are you doing alone? in this solitary place. Everyone's looking for you. Come on, you can't let the fans down. Come on, we've got to go back. They all want more. More of what? The miracles, the healings? Jesus knows what they want more of, and so he responds. And in verse 38, Jesus answers, Let us go on to the neighbouring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For this is what I came out to do. And he went through Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Jesus is not interested in popularity contests. He's not interested in heading back to Capernaum because he needs to go preach to all of Israel. He has a purpose. And we see that his time alone has had a purpose. Now, the new revised version says proclaim. Now, the NIV and the NKJV says, so I can preach. This is why I have come. There are many different words in the Greek which are often translated preach. But we really only have one word in English. It's preach. But with the Greek, and this is why I get excited, and I, I try not to get too excited because I know it can be boring for some, there are so many options, there are nuances and there are moods that, that can change the meaning of a Greek word so easily. But let's, let's unpack what this word means, to preach. Now, I think when we think of preaching, we have a very modern idea on what this means. It's what I'm doing right now, isn't it? I'm, I'm here, I have studied this passage, I have exegeted it. I've written a sermon and now I am trying to deliver it to you in my best voice. But this word that Jesus uses here does not mean the delivery of a edifying speech in well-chosen words and a pleasant voice. That's not what this word means. Now, Jesus has been found in a solitary place where he has been praying 
his disciples find him and say, come on, come back to the people. They're looking for you. And Jesus says that his ultimate reason, his purpose for being here is to proclaim, to preach this word. And that's why we need to understand this word. Because if we just read this verse, let us go somewhere else to a nearby village so I can preach there because that's why I've come. It would feel a bit flat. What do you mean, Jesus? I thought you came to seek and save the lost. To preach? But Jesus has come from the Father in order to proclaim a message. And that message? Well, I'm going to suggest simply, it could be something like this. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim, to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim, to preach freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim, to preach the year of the Lord's favour. This is his mission, the declaration of an event. Now, in the Gospel of John, we don't actually see this particular word because John likes to use the word we often see translated as a witness because Jesus is the proclamation. He is the word in person. So we get to witness. The other three, though, Matthew, Mark and Luke, they have Jesus as the one who proclaims the word, who preaches the word. Now, in the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, this word proclaim is explained like this. Jesus is no longer speaking as a prophet of one to come. He speaks as a prophet of the fulfillment of expectation and promise. He does not announce that something will happen. His proclamation is the event itself. What he declares takes place in the moment of its declaration. So think about that for a moment. Think of the people he healed. He spoke and they were healed. Think of creation. God spoke and it happened. So for Jesus, his mission is to preach the kingdom of God because in preaching the kingdom, guess what? It allows for the reality of this kingdom to be realized by those who hear the good news. So in Luke 4, when Jesus stood up in the synagogue and he read those words I read before, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. After he speaks these words, Jesus rolls up the scroll. He sits back down and everyone is watching him. And what does he say? He says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus chose his times of isolation to prepare himself for his mission. He chose to spend time alone, to pray, to connect, to prepare, so that he could proclaim not just a written word but an event, the good news right here, right now. Let's keep reading this passage, though. Now, even though your Bible may have a heading that separates these two passages, Let's remember that there were no headings, there were no chapters, there were no verses in the original Greek. And what we will discover actually is that these two passages are connected. This passage will end the same way the previous passage started. And we're going to see another two examples of isolation here. So starting in verse 40. A leper came to him, begging him, and kneeling, he said to him, If you choose, you can make me clean. There's so much, there's so much in this one verse. Here is our quarantine isolation. The leper has been in quarantine. He has had to self-isolate. What makes this verse so shocking, though, is that he's even here. He has come to Jesus. He's out in the open where people are. Now, if a leper was anywhere near people, do you know what they had to do? If you wanted to study leprous diseases in detail, then I would encourage you to turn to Leviticus chapter 13 and 14. But a person who has been judged a leper, and this is from Leviticus 13, had to wear torn clothes, let the hair of his head be disheveled, and he had to cover his upper lip 
and cry out, unclean, unclean. And verse 46 says, he shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone and his dwelling shall be outside the camp. I'd like to make a joke here about Melburnians understanding disheveled hair, uh, lips covered with a mask and maybe even our clothes with retail shops closed. But this is a serious issue here. This leper is well acquainted with loneliness. He's had to self-isolate. He's had to social distance from his family, his friends, his whole community. He has had to live alone. And yet he makes a decision to come, to seek Jesus. He has set aside what people will think or say or do and he just comes. And then what he says and like I said, I know the Greek is so boring for so many, but we miss so much because what the leper literally says to Jesus, if you want, you have the power, the ability to make me clean. Jesus, with you lies the only possibility of my restoration. That's what the leper is saying to Jesus. You are the only one who has the power to do this. You are the only hope I have of coming out of my quarantine isolation. And how does the leper's request make Jesus feel? Let's read verse 41. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I do choose, be made clean. Jesus says, I want to restore you. Jesus experiences a gut reaction to this request. Now, some versions say Jesus was indignant or Jesus was angry. The NRSV says he was moved with pity. Jesus looks at this man who has been in isolation due to a condition that he has had no control over and he feels it deep within him. It hurts Jesus to see the pain this man has experienced. What does this teach us about Jesus? What do you learn about Jesus through this? Isolation, social distancing, these are not the long-term plan for his people. Let's keep reading in verse 42. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. After sternly warning him, he sent him away at once and saying to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. But go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he, the leper, went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the word so that Jesus could no longer go into a town openly, but stayed out in the country and people came to him from every quarter. And as this passage finishes, the leper comes out of isolation. He comes out of quarantine, but Jesus is no longer able to appear publicly. And even though my version reads that Jesus had to stay out in the country, it's actually the same words we read in verse 35. Jesus is again in a deserted place or deserted places. Except this time, Jesus has been forced into deserted places. This is his forced isolation. Now we could say that by touching the leper, Jesus is now unclean. He's brought it upon himself. But that's not really the reason he's been forced into isolation, is it? And actually, even as Jesus has been forced into these deserted places, into isolation, the people still came. They came to find him. So this isolation is different to both of the other two. I can't help but wonder this forced isolation. Did Jesus make an exchange? Did he trade his freedom with a, with a leper? It sounds like something Jesus would do, don't you think? Because this forced isolation has allowed the leper freedom. The captive has been set free. And what did the captive do with his freedom as he came out of isolation? He proclaimed. He preached the same word that Jesus used earlier in verse 38. 
Now I want you to stick with me for a moment because the beauty of this passage is multi-layered and I need to show you. It begins and ends with a deserted place. Jesus chooses to go into the deserted place in verse 35, but he is forced into a deserted place in verse 45. In the first instance, his disciples struggle to find him in that deserted place. They have to, they have to enact a manhunt to find him. But the second time, people still come and they find him where he is. Now, Jesus' focus as he came out of his isolation was preaching and proclaiming. And the leper, upon coming out of his isolation after his healing, he preaches and proclaims. And in the middle of the story is the encounter between Jesus and the leper. And here, here we see the heart of Jesus, his mission on display. He's the one who is not just willing, but has the power to restore and heal the leper. And so we see here that even as Jesus preaches, as he proclaims, the reality of his proclamation is made reality. He speaks healing to the leper and it happens he speaks freedom and the leper can come out of isolation and rejoin his community so it's time it's time it's time to see what we can learn from our time in isolation because right now we are finding ourselves in a very long forced isolation some of us stricter than others and slowly preparing to come out of isolation. But what if we flip this and recognize that rather than seeing this as a forced isolation, taking advantage of this time by choosing it as our own isolation? What if instead of feeling that the isolation was forced, we flip it into a chosen isolation? And that in this place and time of lonely, deserted places in our homes, we can connect with God. Jesus used his time in deserted places to pray. So why can't we too take time to pray in our deserted places, in our isolation? This is going to lead us into a closer relationship with God. This alone time with God changes us and it places in our hearts his will, not ours. And what is his will for us? What do you think? The kingdom of God to be proclaimed, to be made manifest in our homes, in our churches, in our schools, in our communities, in our places of work. We can't proclaim without preparation. If Jesus needed time alone with the Father, what makes us think that we don't? We need time for our hearts to be made ready. And this is why we need that alone time, that ISO time. It's in the solitary places that God really speaks to us. He changes us. He shows us wonderful and amazing things. It's in the solitary places that he helps us overcome temptations. It's in the solitary places we can cry our hearts out and lay ourselves bare at the foot of the cross. It's in the solitary places that Jesus was strengthened to fulfill his mission. And it is in the solitary places that we too will be strengthened to go and preach the gospel, the kingdom of God now and to come. Jesus knows what it's like to be in isolation, both by choice and by force. And he used that time to prepare and we too can use this time to prepare. So let's commit to growing, to praying, to reading the word. Let's see the mission that is before each of us. So that we too can go out and proclaim when we come out of isolation. Think of the stories of the experiences that you will be able to share with others if your relationship has been strengthened with God during this time. Because if a leper can come out of isolation and proclaim the good news, so can we. So can we. 
I want to thank you for the opportunity of being able to share this message with you today. I pray that as you consider your time of isolation, you too will understand that Jesus is deeply acquainted with being forced into solitary places and how he used that time to prepare himself for his mission. And that as his followers, as his disciples, we too have an opportunity to come out of this isolation, ready to proclaim the good news of Jesus. Let's pray together. Loving Father, we thank you so much that you're a God who completely understands us, who knows us, who wants to spend time with us and draws us deeper into relationship. Father, it is my prayer today that as we have reflected on this passage in Mark, that we too, Lord, will be bold in proclaiming and preaching the kingdom, your kingdom, right here, right now, recognising that, that this is our mission, to follow Jesus, to do what he did, to, to connect with you, to allow you to transform us and grow us and change us, that as we come out of this time of isolation, that we too may proclaim this good news and share it with others. Father, just be with us, direct our footsteps. We pray in the name of our Saviour, Jesus. Amen. See you next time, folks. Bye-bye.